Mm. Hi everyone, good morning. Welcome to our last and not least, but last um, final webinar for the APEC program. So here we have with us today, our MedTech Innovator team, Frederick and Paul, and also our panelists. So I'll let Frederick and Paul introduce themselves and the rest. So Paul, say a few words and then pass it on to Frederick. Thank you, Sakina. Uh, welcome everyone. Great to have you all back here. Uh, I'm Paul Grand. I'm the CEO here at MedTech Innovator. Uh, this is the MedTech Innovator Asia Pacific Accelerator webinar series. Uh, tonight, we're gonna have one of the most important discussions that we could have, uh, which is about going to market. Uh, strategies, you know, sales, et cetera. You know, these are things that often startups don't think about and scale-ups don't think about until they're actually doing it. And uh, at that time, uh, often they've made some mistakes along the way that make it difficult to be successful at going to the market. So we want people to think about these things much earlier. Uh, and so what we do in this accelerator program is we, we line up great panelists. We've got the expertise that uh, they can share with you to be successful um, so it's not just the companies that are part of the MedTech Innovator Accelerator cohort here in Asia Pacific, the 20 companies that are in that program, but also anyone who is available uh, and who's out there and who's interested in working in the space. You know, these webinars are available for you to, to learn about the topics that are gonna help you get to market successfully. And so we invite you to go back to medtechinnovator.org slash APAC live at any time look back at the entire webinar series. You can watch the archives of all the discussions. Uh, these are the discussions that we've had throughout the program um, with various experts. And again, tonight's topic is one that I think is fitting for the last webinar in this year's series, um, but we do invite you to go back and look at all of them. Uh, so MedTech Innovator, just very briefly, for those of you who've never been part of MedTech Innovator before, is an accelerator for medical technology. We work with startups, small and large uh, scale-ups as well uh, across the entire world. But specifically, this program is focused on the Asia Pacific region. And uh, this was our first year in Asia Pacific with our accelerator. It's been incredibly successful thus far. We have a lot more to come. We have our finals competition coming up on November 18th, which you wanna mark your calendar for. Uh, but if you've not heard of MedTech Innovator 4, if this is your first time, I encourage you to go to our website and learn a little bit about us at medtechinnovator.org. And if you know us well, but you haven't been that involved, please reach out to us. We would love to have you involved in our 2021 program. There's lots to come, uh, very exciting things ahead. Uh, it's been terrific, I know, for our corporate partners who've been a huge part of this year's program. So I'm um, looking forward to hopefully working with anyone who hasn't talked to us yet. Please reach out to us. Um, I'm Paul at medtechinnovator.org. Um, and all the other members here, as you meet them, Sakina is Sakina at medtechinnovator.org, Frederick is Frederick at medtechinnovator.org, and so, so on. So we're easy to find. Um, but again, tonight's discussion is super important. Going to market is everything. You've built your technology, you know, you've researched, you've thought about, you know, how you're going to serve patients. But if you don't have a right plan for going to market, you know, you're not going to be successful. So we want you to avoid those problems. That's what tonight is all about. about. Um, I'm gonna hand this off to Frederick. We'll be moderating the discussion, um, but certainly you know, this is something that we, you know, we encourage all of you to reach out to us about um, in the future, you know, not just to listen tonight, but reach out to us, reach out to the panelists. Um, you know, that's what we're all here for, is to help you succeed. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Frederick Nyberg, our Managing Director in Asia Pacific. Um, who's been championing this program from the very beginning when we first came to Asia Pacific um, two years ago uh, for our launch uh, and, uh, and has been running the accelerator this year here in Asia Pacific uh, along with Sakina. So Frederick, take it away. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Paul. Um, good morning or good evening, everyone, depending on where you're located. Uh, and very welcome uh, to this 11th and final webinar in, in our series this, this year. Um, my name is Frederick Navig. I'm the Managing Director of Medtech Innovator uh, Asia Pacific, based here in Singapore. Um, and um, as Paul mentioned, this webinar is part of our series um, of, uh, for the Accelerator program that we're running here. And today's topic is 
go-to-market strategies, managing sales and distribution. And as usual, we're live streaming this on YouTube uh, for the first mm-hmm. hour. So welcome to our YouTube viewers as well. Um, we have we have an exceptional panel uh, today, and and I'm really thrilled to to introduce <coughs> um, each each of our panelists. Um, it, it is a panel of of uh, industry veterans, probably with, and I haven't done the detailed math and I don't want to reveal anyone's age, but I believe we have a combined um, combined years of experience, probably in the 70 to 80 years range in, and I'm talking specifically about med tech, um, sales, marketing, distribution experience in Asia Pacific. Uh, we have former president international at uh, Acelity, a uh, company that was acquired by 3M for 7 billion last year, uh, and former group president international at Stryker. Uh, Ramesh Subramanian is here uh, today and he'll introduce himself in just a moment. Uh, welcome, Ramesh. Uh, we have uh, commercial director at uh, Marilla Health and former. Um, head of Health Solutions Asia Pacific at Fitbit, uh, Christopher Hall. Welcome, Christopher. Um, and we have Managing Director on Genics and former Head of Strategic Marketing at GE Healthcare. Um, Shikaresh Das is here as well. So with that, uh, let's get started. I will ask maybe each of you to, to very briefly introduce yourselves uh, and talk a little bit about your leadership background in sales marketing, in medtech uh, or digital health uh, here in, in, in the region. And, and maybe I'll start with Ramesh. Oh, thanks, Frederick. And hello, everybody. Uh, I think I probably took the average number of years up quite significantly for this group uh, <laughs> by single-handedly. Uh, but uh, I've, uh, in the last uh, 10 years, I've been uh, exclusively focused on medical technology, uh, starting with my stint at Stryker, where I ran the uh, business outside the United States across the entire Stryker portfolio. That was my first exposure to medical devices and medical technology, having spent the prior 20 plus years in pharmaceuticals uh, across the world and across all sorts of therapeutic areas in commercial and other functional leadership roles. After Stryker, I joined uh, Acelity or KCI in the wound care space. And uh, the entire focus, frankly, throughout the 30 plus years that I've been in the business has been about helping businesses grow. It's about how do you uh, take what you have, maybe find new things that you don't have, you know, innovation and do things like market entry, globalization, et cetera, con- continuously thinking about ways to grow the business. That's always been my passion. That's always been something I've enjoyed doing. And I've been fortunate to have had the opportunity to do it across the world. Thanks for that, uh, Ramesh. Uh, Chris, please. Great. Uh, Thanks, Frederick, for the opportunity to uh, partake today and be part of such a great organization. I know MedTech Innovator has helped a lot of important technology uh, get to the marketplace. So a little bit about my background for the audience. So I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to be in the region now for 10 years, uh, most of that in Singapore. My background's in healthcare, primarily uh, medical technology. And I work for companies like Johnson & Johnson, Fitbit, Roche Diagnostics, Kyogen, uh, but specifically in Asia. I started out with uh, with J&J looking after their lab medicine and robotics business uh, before it was acquired by uh, Carlisle uh, Private Equity. I joined Fitbit shortly after the acquisition where I built up their B2B healthcare business and laid the groundwork for partnerships with Singapore government, other governments in the region and pharmaceutical and med device companies. And today I'm with Marula Health Uh, And I work with health tech startups and companies looking to adapt their products to Asia, whether it's pilot programs or commercial teams. So enough about me. Um, I hope I'm able to share some some insight for the audience today. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Uh, And Shikaresh, please. Thank you, Frederick. Glad to be here. Uh, My background goes back mostly in medtech equipments and you know, even my first company that you work for, that was an SMA in India, which was brave enough to start manufacturing products those days. And I had my uh, first sort of brush with doing more with less. And that sort of learning has stayed with me till date. I moved into Singapore probably around 20 plus years back. And I was hitting the, uh, heading the region for uh, ASEAN region for 
two verticals within Agile and then, then Philips. And I think one of the successful things that we did those days uh, in HP and that later on in Philips and Agile was to look at tiered kind of hybrid kind of a, a organization where you added value with a limited direct presence and as well as you got the volume through the distributor system that we had in place. Uh, then I worked for G for quite some time. And my last role with G was with strategic marketing for emerging markets, which uh, where actually we looked at bridging the gap between emerging different customer buying trains and also how the factory was generating products looking ahead sometime into the future so as to reduce cannibalization within our own groups and also maximize revenue. Uh, currently, I had Ontogenics, which is super specialized in market entry for SMBs and startups, and we have worked with quite a few. I'm glad to be here to share my experience here. Great, thanks, thanks for that, gentlemen. And uh, just a quick question, maybe before another quick question before we we um, we, we kick off. Uh, Paul spoke briefly about this. When, in your view, should a, a startup begin thinking about its commercialization and its go-to-market strategy? Uh, we very often hear, well, it's it's usually it usually happens too late. Um, but practically, when is a good time to start? thinking seriously about that and planning your your commercial rollout. And maybe let me turn to Christopher first on this. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, my view is right away. I think uh, you want to have a sense of who your channel partners will be. Um, you want to do the, the essential pilots if they haven't been done to build up uh, proof sources. You want to make sure that those pilots are done in places that um, uh, are well respected. Um, and then I think um, you want to have a good understanding of the sales process, which is really important. I think a lot of um, companies start on the science side and may not have that expertise. It's really important. And then lastly, I would think about um, the story that you want to tell about the business and about the product you're delivering. I think there's always been a lot of mystique around the science of what some of us do. And uh, I think if you convey that in a, in a very impactful and easy to understand way, it can, it can go a long way to differentiate you. That's, that's, uh, that's good advice. Uh, Ramesh, your, your thoughts on this? You know, <clears throat> just building on what uh, Chris just said, I think for me, it's never too early because the first thing <clears throat> that an entrepreneur, a scientist, an inventor should be thinking about is what problem are they solving with whatever they've got in their hand and for whom? Who is the customer and what's the balance between the various stakeholders in the system, between the clinician, the nurse, the technical staff, the hospital uh, procurement people. So whose problem are you solving and how? And what's the value proposition you have? And I think that starts to start shaping the thought about how do you convey that uh, to the customers, whoever they are, and how early can you start thinking about how you get to them? And I think, as Chris said, you start thinking about how you get to those markets, what channels could you possibly use? How important is it for you to be able to tell your story directly? Because establishing that value proposition, I think is very, very critical. And it's not about, I've got a wonderful gizmo, a beautiful widget, and can I do something with it? Uh, but it's more about what problem you're gonna solve. And I think that's the way people think about it when they start businesses and they invent stuff, but then they forget about the second step. Yep. Great, great uh, feedback there. So let's let's start to, to look in a little bit more detail about um, commercial models or sales models. And uh, for medical devices, typically these are at the most basic level. They're direct models. They're <clears throat> indirect, or as Shikaresh mentioned earlier, hybrid. Um, and and maybe I'll turn to Shikaresh on this. Uh, if can you just very quickly outline the basic differences to everyone on 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 what these different models encompass? Sure. So direct model is where you engage your own sales and service team along with maybe application in a specific region and they are under your payroll and you're touching the customer on several fronts, including product delivery, sales process, the whole nine years. And uh, hybrid will be where you have a limited presence in a country, maybe critical functions like a country manager. I would say more critical would be a service manager organization, service setup an organization with an applications team where you're supporting the distributor at the same time, you're keeping in touch with the pilot sites and your key opinion leaders in a way managing the major <clears throat> and indirect will be where you're completely hands off, you outsource your whole uh, revenue <clears throat> generation process, including customer uh, delivery 
to a third party organization, which is typically a distributor. It may be an online platform in the country. It can be a small uh, company. It can be individual. It can be a distributor. So basically, I would think these are the three steps. And to the second part of your question, where which of the ideal model, I think it depends a bit on the company and its resources. Like if you look at what Intuitive did, uh, there are funded multi-billion dollar funding there. They never went, they actually went direct in many countries and tries to try to get to the key opinion leader to establish a lead in the marketplace of robotics. But uh, for most of the startups, that luxury may not be available. So I would say that uh, probably indirect model would be the best to start is very low cost. You only incur a cost in an indirect or distributor model when the distributor, uh, when you're supporting the distributor and when you're manufacturing your products for delivery, and then you get paid in a certain time. So probably uh, that's perhaps the most safest way to start in a country. Good, thanks. Thanks for that. So we've got the definitions out of the way. Uh, Chris, uh, from your perspective, uh, and even based on your experience, what, um, how do different types of medical devices affect the company's choice? Of, of, of sales model. Um, you worked both with, with in vitro diagnostics products and with, 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 with consumer products and with, uh, um, with, with other medical device products. What, what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I would uh, put it in the context of what your product um, offering actually is. And you've probably got, you've probably got two or three brackets. Um, you've got consumer hardware uh, which might be wearables or blood pressure cuffs or glucose, you know, glucometers, uh, which could be sold at retail, but also online channels. And then you've got the B2B uh, hardware, which is the medical devices and those types of things for more clinical use in the hospital. And then on the B2B platform, I think that's where it's interesting, where companies don't have to play with these traditional channels. Um, at least with Fitbit, I found uh, success with uh, partnerships, and that can be with government, uh, with the example of um, uh, Healthy Living SG partnership, or what Apple just did um, with their device and the Singapore government on incentivizing good behavior. Uh, payers are starting to do incentives with med device and farm companies now to get people healthy. Uh, so there's a number of channels I think you can go to. There's, there's also even hospitals. Uh, they may have certain budgets where, where they can do specific things. So it's, um, it, it's really kind of a greenfield of, of uh, opportunity for companies to do, try new things on the platform side. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, Ramesh, uh, the, the, the key opinion leader relationship is, is fundamental to a lot of medical device uh, sales, if not all. Um, and although there are obviously there are some benefits of setting up an indirect um, uh, sales organization to begin with for a startup, in your view, would it make sense for a startup to still run a direct sales operation somewhere, perhaps in their home market? Um, or is there another, a better way to, to maintain those KOL relationships um, through a distributor organization? What's been some of your experience I, on that? I think, Frederick, from my perspective, the, uh, those choices are partly dictated by what is the value proposition you're bringing to the market. If it is something that is very new, very differentiated, that's going to require a significant amount of education, training for people to either to learn, to appreciate the value whether it's clinical value or whatever, how to use the technology, depending on how complicated it, that is, your, your ability to pick either a distributor who's very, very, very capable of doing that or thinking about whether you should be doing that selectively yourself, that's where it comes in. If you're doing something that's not very differentiated, you're in a crowded marketplace, all you want is somebody who's got the muscle to enter that market and you know, establish some level of presence and penetration very quickly. I think that's where it is. I mean, I know everybody would like, obviously, customer relationships to be held directly. And that's, I think, the fundamental bias of any business is you want that closeness, that <clears throat> connection to the customer. So I think with a distributor in between, it usually is not so simple to build a relationship of trust very quickly with a distributor that allows you access to what they think is their customer base, right? 
<clears throat> they've built it. That's a significant value they're bringing to you. And unless you over time build some sort of an understanding of when you win, they win, when they win, you win, it doesn't work. And they tend to be very protective of those relationships uh, <clears throat> and don't give you access. So building that takes a while. Uh, so I think having your own direct connection always helps, but it can't be conflicting with a channel partner you might have. Yeah, good, good point, good point. And um, Shikaresh, in terms of, if we look at different indirect sales models, there are, there are different options. You've got the distributors, of course, but um, where you have single distributors for, for single markets, you have multiple distributors in any one market, but you also have global um, potential licensing arrangements with multinationals. Um, what are there any other indirect options that a, a startup should should think about early, and what are some of the pros and cons of those? Yeah, I think the the fourth model that we have experimented with, and I have to be frank with you, it was not for a startup; it was for MNCs and SMEs, but uh, probably can be put into practice as a manufacturer's rep model. And what it entails is selecting, you know, you select a certain key areas in a geography, uh, maybe specific towns or states, and go and appoint a smaller organization, maybe a single man company or, you know, somebody who's legally authorized to do business where the key relationships, and you have to manage that. And obviously that comes with a very low cost, but also you're, you know, there is a specific time lag between what time you employ uh, or employ a distributor to the time he starts earning for a startup. It can be six to nine months. So you have to possibly stop thinking of subsidizing that model for a few months before you start generating revenue. But we have seen, we had did that for a company which was a smaller, uh, I won't say an SME, smaller company. And then in Australia, and we uh, managed that model for a year. We had a growth of 30% month on month. And after a year, we gave it off to that. So there are models possible. It depends possibly the kind of product you have and kind of outcome you're trying to get from the marketplace. Yeah, good, good, uh, good comments there. Um, so Shikaresh, you mentioned, you spoke earlier about um, hybrid sales model. And maybe I'll turn to, to Ramesh for some practical examples, maybe in, in, in your, your past with either a Salati of Striker or where you have uh, led hybrid models and, and what they typically look like. Um, and, and can a hybrid sales model be successful uh, within a single country or a single market? I think uh, <clears throat> the key uh, to all of this is really being able to segment uh, the marketplace very, very clearly. And that's not always easy to do. So in some markets in Europe, for example, you can actually segment it based on provinces or because reimbursement can be quite different from one region to another, et cetera. Similarly, in uh, large markets like China, it might be possible for you to actually segment that and say, these are areas, provinces, geographies where I want to maintain a strong presence because these institutions will really drive adoption, drive penetration and help me spread the message around. But there are others which are too complicated to get to to Shikarish's point, too expensive for us to get to straight away. So we do that. And I think it's possible to do that. I think where it gets potentially messy is if you don't have a, a good understanding in your own mind of pricing models. I think this is where things can get uh, quite messed up uh, and uh, you have all kinds of value leakage. Uh, the way you do things like credit terms, the way the distributor model works, uh, how much inventory they're supposed to carry, you know, who's responsible for collection. I, those are things that you have to be very, very clear in your head when you go uh, into those models, but there's no reason why it can't work. I think the reason sometimes it doesn't work is people aren't clear about market segmentation uh, and they're not really sure what, why they're trying to do this, maybe convenience, maybe cost. And that clarity, if it's not there, makes it difficult to execute. Yeah, thanks. I think the point about market segmentation is, is is critical, and we could do a whole separate webinar on that on that one topic. Uh, that's that's clearly important. Chris, uh, some of your thoughts about hybrid hybrid sales models, and, and is that something that you've 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 worked on? Yeah, a little bit. I think uh, it really depends on the product and its complexity. But um, we've we've certainly gone direct, but then had. Uh, 
say, say maybe a, a B2C model with, uh, with online marketplaces. Um, and some of that's growing quite quickly. I mean, I think we know the, the big ones out there as far as online, but there's, uh, there's a number in China and Indonesia that have really uh, taken a lot of share away from the big companies uh, that, 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 that can do a lot for a company, so. And, and Chris, I'll stay with you here for a second. Given your background, having worked with, with a product like, uh, like Fitbit in, in the consumer wearable um, and obviously focused on their, on their healthcare business, w- what are some of the fundamental differences in channel management and sales distribution management um, if you compare a traditional medical device with a, a digital health um, product or, or, a, or a wearable or a consumable the way that you worked in in in, in Fitbit, and and I, I, I'm I I would expect that be a whole different set of options available to you, in terms of channels that are not uh, traditional to the uh, to the more conventional medical device business. Yeah, right. I mean, I think um, well, one you've got the retail channels for the hardware, mm-hmm. uh, which can be uh, brick and mortar and also uh, online marketplace, but I, but I think where it gets really interesting, where the growth potential is, is on the, the health, the clinical healthcare utility side. I think that's that's the explosion that's waiting to happen in, in devices. We've probably got several thousand medical, several thousand wearables out today uh, that are just sitting somewhere. So the interoperability and a number of things that haven't really been addressed yet well uh, need to be addressed. So I think that being said, the, the real opportunity is with, um, with the payers and helping them work out new uh, plans to, to get that integrated in the system, working with hospitals directly uh, on that, on that uh, interface to make sure that those data can travel smoothly back and forth and really be impactful, impactful for a patient as well as a doctor and simple to use. Um, and then partnerships with pharma. I mean, I think if, if you've got a wearable, I think a pharmaceutical company or a med device company would be very interested. Say for example, if they have a mental health application, uh, well, let me frame it this way. Say a pharma company has a, has, has a drug uh, for, for men to treat mental health it could be very advantageous to partner with a wearable company that might be able to develop a, a platform that can help engagement um, with the symptoms of that for surveillance and even perhaps um, start to gather data that pharma companies may not have and that could help with market access. So there's a number of benefits on both sides here and I think there's been some experimentation out there. Some of it's worked out quite well and I think it's still quite early but, but I think that's, that's the raw opportunity. Yeah. No, thanks for that, uh, Chris. Um, the, in, in, in the, the choice of commercial model, um, there's obviously an, an, an impact on longer term sales performance. And maybe I'll just ask Ramesh briefly to comment on this. Uh, do you typically always see that direct markets sales performance wise outperform indirect distributor markets? Um, or is, is that not necessarily the case? I think most management teams' bias would be to say, yes, direct is better because they've put a lot of money in and they've got to justify uh, the fact that that's the choice they made and they're making a return. But leaving the cynicism aside for a second, I think the key is what do you measure Mm -hmm. when you talk about sales performance? I mean, you can look at it on a quarterly basis. You can look at it from a growth perspective. But from my perspective, it's always been about penetration and share. Uh, You know, how many people who should have access to this and who should be using this particular product are actually getting it? And if they're not getting it, why? Is it our competition doing better than us, et cetera? So if you've got the right metrics, I think uh, it's it's better to measure. I've seen examples where if you've built a really strong relationship with the distributor, they are as vested in delivering outstanding performance uh, as you are. And in fact, they sometimes make more money than you. Uh, if uh, they are successful. So I think the, uh, the, the, the question is really, how do you measure uh, the right thing? But I think you know, having the direct contact with customers is probably the differentiating factor because it's not just the platform for your existing business, it's what it allows you to do going forward as you bring more innovation, more new things to the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, 
Now, I, Ado Shikaresh, you mentioned earlier, uh, you talked about manufacturers' reps, and um, um, there is the, um, the concept of medical science liaisons that I wanted to just touch on very briefly. Um, this is, is something which is quite well established in the pharma industry, relatively new to medical devices. Um, have you done any work in that area, Shikaresh? Are you familiar with that as a concept? Actually, not so much, but I did uh, ask around, uh, you know, MSL was a concept that has been coming up recently. And what I found they have done is they have taken parts of the uh, past of the job definitions from different uh, parts of the organization, like maybe the clinical uh, clinical part of it, part of marketing and created this entity for a more focused approach. And when I looked into uh, and spoke to the people in the industry, which is mostly equipment where I'm strong in, and I found that this is yet to be taking a concrete shape within this organization. So maybe it's something trained for the future. Right now, it's in the process of forming. And I'm going to stop there. Yeah, yeah. Now, Ramesh, obviously, you, you've spent many years in the pharma industry uh, working with heading the MSD organization here in the region. Uh, did you have medical science liaison um, individuals in that organization? And is that a concept that, that applies to med tech? And if so, is it something that a startup should start thinking about? Well, I think uh, firstly, to you must understand the context and where the MSLs, even in the pharmaceutical industry, first came about, right? Mm. As compliance uh, rules started to tighten uh, in terms of what a sales rep could actually talk to customers about, it became very clear, for example, off-label discussions were a complete no-no, and very often reimbursement discussions were a complete no-no. So you needed to have effectively a kind of a neutral body, which was called a, a MSL, and there were all kinds of complexities around that. However, having said that, I think fundamentally the ability to have, quote unquote, unbiased, very objective, scientific, clinical discussions uh, with customers, I think is a value that uh, many people would have because they not, don't feel pressured that they're being uh, you know, just forced to buy something. Uh, and I personally think that, that that should become more and more of a trend, particularly in devices which are so heavily dependent on training and education of customers. So I think there should be a trend moving in that direction, but the definition between a salesperson and a, a medical science liaison is something that's not always easy to define as, uh, as uh, Shikaresh mentioned. People tend to cobble together bits and pieces, and that's not very clear thinking. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And of course, in medical devices, we've always had the, the clinical specialists for, for a long period of time that have, have played that role. So, so I, I sort of see the MSL as being a, a clinical specialist on steroid almost. It's, it's a high-powered well-educated, often someone with a medical degree who can have that um, direct communication with key opinion leaders and, and, and clinicians. Um, changing topic a little bit, uh, we're, we're, we're obviously in the middle of, of a pandemic here, and I wanted to, and maybe I'll turn to Chris first for this. What has been, what have you seen as the impact of, of COVID-19 on, on the selling process, on, on customer interaction, on clinical training, um, on, on the whole commercialization of, of medical devices here in the region over the last six months? Uh, and, and are there some, some new tools that, um, that you might have come across that potentially could address some of those uh, challenges? Sure. I guess it uh, depends on the business that you're in. Because some people have, uh, have been hurt pretty bad and, and then some have, uh, have found a great opportunity. So I think um, at least on the healthcare side, if you're not addressing COVID directly, then your initiative is, is probably further down the ladder. Uh, that, that's, that's on the, the forefront of, of clinicians, what they're doing today. So I, I know things are starting to get back to normal in Singapore and other countries that are a different speed, but... Um, um, it, it really depends on the stage that they're in, how they're able to cope. Um, I, th I think that the telehealth companies have done quite well, uh, and I think it's been a, a great opportunity to see that advance. Um, where I would have liked to have seen that move forward uh, many years ago, it's, it's, it's great to see that. I think in, uh, in surgery and the OR, things will, will, will move quicker towards uh, virtual reality and, and uh, augmented reality as well. So certain, certain sectors will, will move quickly. I think on the supply chain side, it's been very challenging. I know in orthopedics, it's been difficult, um, even in laboratory testing. I worked with a customer recently and we were, well, actually a couple of months ago, we, we tried to get 
molecular tests to a, uh, a government ministry of health in Eastern Europe. And we had challenges getting the validation kits out of China. Um, we, we finally sent them through the embassy through the diplomatic bags. So they arrived, but it was, uh, it, it, was, it was quite a challenge to deal with that. And, and it's hard to get around those things. Um, so I think, I think companies are starting to look at, at, at new um, manufacturing hubs I know Vietnam is, is one that a lot of MNCs are looking to now to, to kind of diversify their, their risk uh, when these types of things uh, take place. Again, I'm sure they will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. And, and Shikar, I know you've been involved in, in some AR and VR tools for sales reps in, in medtech um, as, as a possible solution to some of the, the, the challenges now with COVID, but when, when reps can no longer... Um, visit the OR and, and uh, spend as much time in the hospital as, as they used to. Do you want to tell us just very briefly about that and what some of the trends might be in that area going forward? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, uh, the access to customers, it was always difficult in a public uh, setting or organization has become much more restricted as we speak because of COVID. And I was part of our discussions between the teams to see whether the rape in the OR, specifically in some of the surgical aspects like uh, maybe a knee surgery or some place where the rape is inside, whether that function can be made more efficient by using technologies like air and VR. And we found there are several challenges there. First of all, uh, if you are streaming live, and that's probably required for a setup like that, the privacy issues that come up. And if you're streaming live to a central, maybe a console system where you're receiving instructions, privacy issues that come up, there are technological challenges like uh, sometimes the ORs are completely sealed off and you're not able to get in Wi-Fi or other signals out of the OR. So I think the teams are still struggling with it. But in terms of clinician education, one of clinician education on demand, educating the sales rep, the service people, Airware has definitely taken hold in the last few months and quite a few companies I know have implemented that. Mm. But uh, raping the OR is still a works in progress. Yeah. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. Um, just ra sort of wrapping up our, our discussion on, on uh, distribution and channel management, perhaps. Uh, and Ramesh, I wanted to get your perspectives on 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 um, the what sometimes referred to as the value segment play. Uh, I know you were deeply involved in Stryker's acquisition in China of, of Trousons a few years ago. Um, and maybe just very briefly, tell us a little bit about the thinking behind that and how that then affected your subsequent branding and, and uh, channel considerations. Yeah, this will be <clears throat> challenging to keep it short, so I'll try and do yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm sorry about that. Uh, but, but no, no. <clears throat> it's it's uh, a but, very interesting topic for everyone. But I think the way we thought about it was, you know, there's a huge uh, opportunity in China, but with the portfolio that we had, a significant chunk of that market was not accessible to us. We were simply overpriced, not just from the point of view of the product itself, but our entire business model was too expensive for that channel. Our instrumentation cost too much. That we went to market cost too much. Everything was just simply inappropriate for that channel. So <clears throat> we also found that there were companies, many of them local, who were producing really high quality product. Frankly, uh, if we were willing to admit it, as good as anything we would make, but at much, much, much better uh, cost points and with a much better business model in terms of instrumentation, efficiency, <clears throat> et cetera. And so as we studied that, we thought, you know what, we need to be able to do this, but we need to be able to do this separate. And this goes back to segmentation, right? So we need to be able to say there are, of course, in those geographies where the value segment opportunity was big, there are customers who want to pay and access premium products as well. And so if you start muddling your thinking, you lose. So, so that was the basic thinking. How do you access huge chunks of the market, not only in China, but frankly, across uh, emerging markets? And honestly, we had lots of discussions about even the US and Western Europe, uh, where price pressures are significant. And these products are really, really uh, are quite adequate uh, to uh, approach those markets. The challenge was taking it outside of China uh, because we already had a premium product presence in most markets, including other emerging markets. And it was quite a challenge, actually, culturally within our organization, not so much in the marketplace, but within our organization to convince leadership in those markets to say, hey, by the way, you're not doing too well with your premium products. We'd like you to you know, take these uh, 
you know, value products, the so-called Me Too products, and market them aggressively. And in some cases, we even talked about withdrawing our premium products from those portfolios. For people who work for multinationals and all these markets, culturally, that was a bit I of can, a shock. I can imagine. Yes. What was that under the Striker brand, or you used the Trousers brand? No, we wanted to keep it separate uh, yeah. you know, and do it, uh, but we wanted sense. the same leadership to run it because we didn't want to create separate companies and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that, that was quite a challenge. And I think that continues to be work in progress. Uh, and in some cases, it's easier where you don't have a premium product presence to just go in with that. But you've got to remember that the business model has got to be different from what you do normally. And I think when you start mixing the two, it doesn't work. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we have a number of companies in, in, in our cohort that are actually in, in, in the area of, of developing, um, I wouldn't use the term maybe frugal innovations, but innovations that are specifically targeted um, low cost emerging markets. And, and uh, that might be uh, useful useful um, information for them. I wanted to move on to, to the topic of working with um, with distributors, and, and maybe I'll turn to Shikaresh on this. Um, we often get the, the question from from startup companies that haven't really gotten um, anywhere yet with their commercial planning. How? What's the best way to find a distributor? Is it is it just attending a trade show and 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 have someone come to your booth and you give them the agency? Um, what what are some of the pitfalls and what are some of the best practices there? Yeah, Frederick, the process you mentioned is probably the one which is adopted by most of the companies. Uh, people come to fly into a different region, attend a trade show and appoint a distributor. I think we have seen quite a few of those companies come back to us to help them, uh, you know, reassess the market and find the right match for them. I would always say that, uh, you know, start, start with a blank, start with a piece of paper and put your attributes in there. What are you looking for from the distributor? Said that correctly. Are you looking for a focused niche uh, company which is having a lot of clinical capabilities? Are you selling medical equipment, high value equipment, which requires sales and service and inventory, et cetera, et cetera. Now, once you have got those down, I would say start with some secondary research. You don't have really fly into the country, call your friends, call your contacts and have a long list of maybe, maybe 20 companies that you want to touch base on and then fly into the country at the same time, you do a diligence face to face and ask the customers. If you have developed some relationships with the key opinion leaders or anyone there, ask the customers about the reputation. And here, one factor that comes up is that typically distributors in larger geographies are consolidating. It's happening in China, happened to a certain extent in Australia, is always there in Australia actually. And sometimes it's the question of distributor wanting to work with you rather than you wanting to work with the distributor. So actually you may have less of seller power and the distributor may have more or buyer power and you may have to give quite a lot to get the distributor of your choice. So to summarize, I think I'll say, get your attributes correctly at, in the beginning before you start the search. So you have less chance of a mismatch later. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. I think that's, that's good feedback. And it's, it's always a challenge for a smaller company with an unknown brand. To, to compete <clears throat> for all the big brands that a distributor may carry and, the, and a distributor sales rep may carry in their bag. And, and, and those, I guess, are the, your real competition very often. Um, right. It's because it's really a competition for time, isn't it? Um, and I think the, the, the advice of, of actually speaking to clinicians and KOLs and customers and get their advice on, on picking a distributor, I think is, is, is a good one. Um, uh, Ramesh, just coming back to you briefly in terms of the, the, the role that you see the distributor take on. Um, are, are there some functions broadly? What are those roles? Um, we spoke about inventory. We spoke about collection. We spoke obviously about end user training and so on. Are there some functions in your view that are always better uh, kept in house um, for 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 your own organization to to to, to lead? What what are your, some of your perspectives on that? I, I think going back to what Shikaresh said, you know, what are you looking for when you're going into a new market and what do you want the distributor to bring for you or to you? And I think the question there is, is this an opportunity for you to learn about how the market functions and build that expertise over time, irrespective of whether you choose to work with that distributor for a very long time or not? I think just getting really familiar with how the market dynamics are 
from a regulatory perspective, if there's reimbursement, you know, how does that work? Are there on a hospital chains? Are there GPOs? Whatever it is about the organization, what's the buying process? Who calls the shots? So I think, you know, you don't need to necessarily have the ability to run logistics because I think there's another version of a hybrid model, just to digress for a second, which is you have a direct sales force, but you have a third party logistics provider mm. who imports the product, ships it around, collects and all that sort of stuff. So you don't worry about the physical distribution. So I think there are, in that model, you want to figure out what is it that you really, really want to learn. There's always the issue that you find, and I'm sure all of us have experienced this, where you discover that the distributor long ago, mm -hmm. somebody gave them, got them to register the product. They own the registration. So you have almost zero flexibility to get out unless you pay a king's ransom. Yep. So thinking about those kind of things, and that's why to Shikharaj's point, talking to clinicians, talking to other people who've had experience in that marketplace, including other principals who might be working with that distributor who are not competitors for you is an important way to learn it. But I think the customer relationship is probably the key. And then I would go to regulatory and reimbursement as being the next uh, most important. Yeah. And the physical moving of boxes and stuff like that is, for me, uh, less, less important as long as it's done well. Right, right. Yeah, some good points there. And I think the, the, the point about checking with other principles with non-competing products as part of your due diligence is uh, is a really good tip. I just wanted to remind um, our cohort companies who are on the um, on the Zoom call today that if you have any questions, you can either type them into chat uh, or into better, sorry, if, if you type anything you type into chat is a general comment, type into the Q&A, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will address your questions um, at the end of the hour. Uh, Chris, distribution channels in many Asian markets are it can be incredibly complex with multiple tiers, um, especially in parts of Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, China, and so on. Um, are, is it inevitable for a for a medtech startup to to have to navigate those? And and what what typically do they look like? And it's in Singapore. It's it's fairly straightforward. Uh, there is one intermediary between you and a hospital, uh, but that's not necessarily the case in in uh, Taiwan or Korea or China. Do, do you want to comment on that perhaps? Sure. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll, I'll frame it in, uh, in the experience I had managing cold chain products at J&J. Please, and yeah. I think that's something that you want to consider um, as a startup is how much complexity does your does your, your, your product offering have? So with J&J, &J, it was pretty high because cold chain products, we had products with three different temperature requirements. And there may be a number of 3PLs, third party logistic partners uh, throughout Asia that uh, are very highly regarded. But uh, when it comes to managing cold chain uh, are, are far from uh, <laughs> being where we needed them to be. So I think Shikarash brought up some good points about, um, you know, make sure that, that both sides want to work together. I think that's important. You certainly may not have as much leverage if you're a startup, but if you are a startup, I think it's important that the CEO begins those communications. Uh, I think that relationship is important if you don't have as much clout. Um, so back to the cold chain, I think if you've got complexity in your, in your products, you want to think about, um, really vetting uh, that, that company carefully with due diligence of, of site visits, um, audits. And in our case, we actually validated the process. So we put temp tails in the products, make sure they got from A to B in a specified time. We want to understand their, their, their emergency procedures in case something happened, because we had, um, we had cardiac markers that if someone is admitted to the A&E and had a heart attack, there has to be a redundancy process and a, you know, a backup plan uh, in case the hospital doesn't have that product on hand. They generally do, but, but you have to just make sure that uh, there's human lives uh, at this. So, um, so yeah, just, just do the due diligence, I, I would say. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, I think it was Shikaresh who earlier talked uh, briefly about the consolidation of um, distributors in some of the markets and, um, uh, some of some of the people in our audience, perhaps you may have heard of uh, China looking to consolidate its um, specialty medical device uh, distributor um, sector by this uh, concept known as the two invoice system. Um, 
who of you gentlemen would be comfortable talking a little bit about the two invoice system just to, to give a quick heads up to, to, to those companies who are listening in, who are planning to enter China, but um, to whom I think this would be a, a, a critically important piece of, piece of information. Chris, perhaps. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, China is uh, a very complex market. So you've got several levels, the national level, the, the province, city, even hospital. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the two-part invoice, I think, is a good thing. I mean, we're, the, we're in the age of transparency. And uh, to me, it's, it's less complex because you've got an invoice for the customer and an invoice for the distributor. So there's just less room for, for more middlemen. So essentially, sorry to interrupt you, Chris. So essentially, just as a definition, what it what it means is you can only have two invoices between the manufacturer and the hospital, right. essentially. So right. the government is proactively trying to slash uh, multiple layers of of distributors. Um, I think that's essentially the philosophy behind the the, um, the policy, right? Right. To my view, it's a good thing. Uh, yeah, at least, I agree. At least what I've seen. If if anybody else has has thoughts on that, I could be completely wrong, but. Uh... Yeah, I think probably I can I can take a shot at it. So go ahead, happened, please. Sir. Few years, I think China, uh, there's a lot of value being lost from the manufacturer right to the end customer, and it was as it has let's say probably forty percent was the distributor markup that was happening. And I think China realized that and said, okay, you can have only two invoices from the time the product land in customs to the end customer. And what it did that. What it, that is, what it did to the market is a lot of spot dealers, as we call it, which were there, uh, smaller indiv individuals, entities, which are handling the last mile delivery to the uh, person or person or to the hospital where they had a relationship. Those things vanished overnight. And I think right now that has constantly consolidated. And right now, China distribution has come to large, major, powerful houses, which are holding the licenses. And for a startup, what that means is become slightly more difficult for them because it's more buyer power in favor of the distributor. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will have to negotiate uh, very strong terms in their favor, in favor of the distributors, if you really want to take your technology there. Like for example, they may want the manufacturing rights. They may want any development rights for the country if you're a startup. And it's up to you at that point of time to say, yes, I want to do that, sign up, or maybe not enter the market. But it's become slightly more tougher for the startups as they think after the two invoice has been fully implemented. Yeah, yeah. Good. good if I can just add, I think, uh, Please. as Finish pointed out, uh, you know, the whole objective was to reduce the value leakage uh, in, in the system. And when they first implemented this, and it, they did it for pharmaceuticals first and then uh, yeah. brought it on to devices, it was difficult to find uh, large enough distributors who would cover the whole country. So you'd end up per force with more than two steps. And that became a challenge. But then you have these large groups, but your leverage shrinks. And to the point that Shikharesh made, a lot of these uh, so-called spot dealers or third and fourth level dealers uh, converted themselves into logistics providers. So they were still in business, but they were no longer consuming a quote unquote margin uh, from invoicing, but they were collecting a fee for that. Because frankly, the country is so big, you can't really serve it by saying, I've got a distributor in Beijing. I'll shove it in his warehouse, and life goes on. It's not going to happen, right? So. Yeah, good, good, good point. Um, let's just talk briefly about keeping distributors motivated, and and, and maybe Ramesh, I'll stay with you uh, here. Ultimately, you want to make sure that you have a, a successful partnership with your distributor, um, and you want to make sure that they are loyal. Um, and I think we can probably talk at length about cases when 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 there are. Um, compliance challenges in that area, but but how do you ultimately keep them motivated? And especially for a smaller company that may not necessarily have the leverage that you would have as, as a large multinational. So I, I think fundamentally the way we thought about it, uh, Frederick, was the way you engage employees is the same way you engage distributors. Mm. They are an extension of your organization. If you think of them as the enemy or some third party who's always irritating you and all you want to do is to shove something down their throats and you want to extract money from them. It's not going to work. It wouldn't yeah. work with your employees. It won't work with them. So fundamentally, it's about engagement. And, you know, these are business people. I mean, they're not, you know, employees. They're, so their motivation is very different. Uh, and many of these are family businesses, sometimes multi-generational family businesses. So they have a lot of pride as well. Mm. So whether you're big or small, 
I think just doing the normal stuff that you would do to engage is key. Of course, they must win economically, so as, as must you, and so on and so forth. So I don't think it's rocket science, but it's fundamentally, this is part of, you're part of my team. And if you don't do that, I don't think you have a chance. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, that's 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 a good that's a good point. Um, at at some point, um, a relationship with the distributor obviously um, either it goes south or you may choose to go direct in in a market that uh, that has been indirect. What are some of the and, and maybe Chris, I'll I'll ask you to comment on this. Um, what are some of the pitfalls there maybe to look out for in terms of? Um, uh, situations where a principal is looking to decouple its relationship part, part ways with a distributor. Um, what are some of the risks? What are some of the, the, the things to watch out for if, if, if that's um, on the cards? Yeah, I think I've been through a couple of those. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh, you want to be careful with that. And uh, you, you want to ensure that that your company has built trust with, with the customers beyond the distributors possible. Uh, because if you lose that distributor, if you have to move to another one, it's, it can be a painful process, especially in a, a developing country. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's not an easy thing. So, uh, so try to, as Ramesh pointed out, try to not only build the relationships with the distributors, but, but also with the customers uh, directly. Yeah. Any any other thoughts on this from from anyone else? I think uh, it's an extremely painful process to either swap distributors or when you're going direct, probably slightly less painful. And uh, we have had situations where uh, this thing happens. You cannot avoid it. Uh, firstly, I think uh, with the with the warranty obligations coming in, the company needs to have a complete record of all the install bases. That's the first thing. And sometimes the distributor will commit more than what you are authorized the distributor. And in that case, you really have an angry customer who's not being serviced to the terms that the product has been sold to. So one way to go around this is to ethically re-employ some of the distributor organization people into the organization. So that way you have a continuity of customer relationships. And uh, I don't think there's a magic bullet here. You got to bite that and really take it on as it is. And there's a lot of pain involved in that. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to before we we um, we close here and um, conscious of time here, wanted to touch briefly on on compliance um, and uh, for, for and adhering to a recognized code of conduct. This is something obviously for for um, almost every multinational in medical devices. It's central to 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 what they do, um, and and typically this code of conduct um, applies to the distributor as as well, um, and and maybe Ramesh, I'll turn to you on this. Maybe get some of your thoughts on 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 the con general concept of compliance, and especially how it may apply to a startup, because I think compliance is probably not necessarily top of mind for a startup venture. Um, but if they one day are thinking of a trade sale to a multinational, which has a strict code of conduct, certainly part of their due diligence is that they'd, they'd want to make sure that they're whoever they're acquiring are, 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 are fully compliant and, and, uh, and therefore uh, how important is this to, to a startup as, as they start to do due diligence and with, with distributors and, and um, manage uh, complex sales channels? Ramesh. Yeah, in my view, is very simple. It is absolutely critical. It's as critical as being able to assure everybody that the product that you produce and put out there has the highest quality and won't cause any harm to anybody under any circumstances. I think compliance has got to be thought about exactly the same way because when you don't have compliance, you are actually doing harm to somebody, whether it's economic harm or potentially even worse. So I think that to me is a no-no. And honestly, uh, it, 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 it's like saying, you know, will I have different quality standards for my product in different markets? The answer is usually no. And so I won't have different compliance standards as well. Now, obviously, there's always a debate about, you know, culturally, ABC market, et cetera. But I don't think you should define compliance from a legal perspective or a regulatory perspective. I think it's simply a mindset in terms of how do you want to be and how do you want to be perceived? And I think it's very simple. 
Yeah, great point. And and maybe a piece of advice to to the startups on the call here. Uh, do take a look at some of the trade associations, whether it's APAC Med or AdvaMed or others. You can usually download their codes of ethics um, free of charge from their websites. Just have a look at those and, and uh, uh, make sure that you um, you are not too far off. Um, I wanted to, to turn to Shikaresh briefly and um, talk a bit about um, service technical service and the, and, the, and the role of the biomedical engineer and, and, and how that can be potential incremental revenue and, and what uh, channel management implications may come with, with service of, of larger capital equipment. I think that's a fantastic point. And many of the startups that I have seen uh, ignore this specific important aspect in the very last. So I would say, first of all, have a service strategy. How do you get your replacement parts to the uh, target country? How do you, where do you hold the inventory? What are the price, parts pricing? What are the meantime weight in failure, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of revenue streams, I think initially it could be difficult for a company which is small in terms of resource to get a, uh, make service a profit center. Typically, I would say start as a cost center and focus mainly on uh, warranty obligations, servicing that, and also for your generating revenue from parts. And as you mature into a hybrid or a full direct organization, that time you can start thinking about perhaps uh, getting a revenue out of service and start taking service contract directly in that country to uh, you know serve customers. And that will be my quick piece of advice for service. It's an extremely important aspect and uh, there should be a clear strategy path for every parts of the service aspect like parts, warranty, extension of warranty, et cetera. Good, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, I am conscious of time. There are multiple topics here that we could probably, uh, that, would, that would warrant their own standalone webinars. Um, but um, in the interest of time, I will ask each of our panelists to, to maybe provide some final advice for um, the startup founders and, and CEOs as they begin to to, to, to think about product commercialization um, and, and um, grappling with some of the sales and distribution challenges. And, and maybe I'll start with, with Christopher on this. Sure. Well, I think uh, you first wanna be really clear on your story and the problem that you're, you're looking to solve. Um, you wanna have sufficient uh, clinical evidence and proof sources, uh, preferably from uh, um, peer review sources, not, not internal marketing. Um, intimate knowledge of the sales process, um, and, and, and lastly, get, get ready for an adventure. Good. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Shikaresh. Yeah, I would say uh, as a first tip, I think you have to choose your markets extremely carefully. It's like a ladder you're going up. If you are midway through and coming down and going up on a different ladder, it could be extremely painful. So get as much knowledge of the country in terms of regulatory, buying behavior, paying capacity, availability of distributor and then choose to go there. And uh, also I think that as a second point, I would add that perhaps get some commercial expertise within the organization, especially for companies which are completely technical oriented and the founders have a complete like PhDs in you know, whatever technical stuff they do. So it's extremely important to do that. And so that you have a you know, clear vision of where you want to go and what are the pitfalls, what are the headwinds that you may face in a new geography. Or commercialization. Good, thanks, thanks. And uh, Ramesh? Uh, not to repeat what has already been said, I think uh, fundamentally it's never too early to be thinking about this. Frankly, as soon as you have a product concept, you should be thinking about why would anybody pay me anything for this? And once you start with that question, you can work backwards to who are my customers, which markets do I go for? And I think the important point Shikharish is making, if you don't have knowledge or prior experience or expertise in this space, try and get some advice as early as possible uh, so that you don't have missteps along the way. Those could be expensive and delay you a lot. Excellent, thank you very much for that. Um, so gentlemen, with that, I think we've come to the end of the hour. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay on the line. Um, we will part ways at this point with our YouTube viewers and move on to our Q&A with our cohort. So. Uh, Thanks uh, to those of you who've been watching this on YouTube and um, we'll resume in, in about 30 seconds time. Okay.